into your pocketbook from businesses. So, uh, he said, are you talking, are you, am I qualified to talk about money? Well, if you want to know my qualifications, I have my, um, I have three different investment licenses, uh, series seven, series 65, series six, SIE exam, which that's whatever. And then the series 63, which allows me to do business in the States. And also, uh, so I work in personal finance lingo and financial planning, and I also work uh, with businesses too in their finances. So he said, "Okay, okay, I just want to know if I can believe it." Um, so there's a few different types of inflation. I'm gonna look them up because I'm not. I don't want to. Do, oh, whoops. Uh, talk about like you know off the top of my head here, but you have. Uh, let's see. So you have what's called cost push inflation, you have demand pool inflation, and you have um, – there's another one there. And demand pool and – let's see if it has it here. I guess it's not. So you, we'll just say cost push and demand pool, right? So cost push inflation occurs when price increases due to the increases in uh, production costs, such as raw materials and wages. Then you have – Demand pull inflation, which is caused by strong consumer demand for a product or service. Uh, when there's a surge in demand, that means that people are buying more and it's lowering the supply of the good. What it looks like they don't have here is they're talking about you have to take into consideration the supply of money, which is what's actually causing, for the most part, the inflation we're experiencing here in the United States. The supply of money can increase in many different ways. But what we're experiencing is extremely low interest rates. Interest rates were already low leading into the COVID pandemic, and they were even lower because of the pandemic. They've been low for a long time, but they've been extremely low near zero since uh, 2020. On top of that, we had three COVID stimulus packages. All three of them, I believe it's, yeah, three, uh, not only were, you know, two of them, I believe over a trillion dollars, but they were handing out stimulus checks at that. Plus all the PPP loans, all the unemployment benefits, all that stuff. And they pumped money into the economy, physical money to everyday people, to businesses, everything. When interest rates are low, the reason why that puts more money into circulation is because it makes the cost of borrowing less. When the cost of borrowing is less, that means banks have, uh, and they were getting more money basically to the banks. Banks were able to lend out a lot more money to regular people, and people are more willing to borrow because they don't have to pay a higher interest rate on the principal that they're borrowing. That's why you see the housing market just take off the way it did, and prices were doubling. In some places for housing, um, the reason being is, well, I can go and pay, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, let's just say, for a house with a four percent rate, or I can pay three hundred thousand dollars for a house with a two percent rate. And borrowing doesn't just end though on the housing market; it goes into buying a car, it goes to uh, borrowing for businesses, anything you go to b- take a loan out on, credit, credit cards, all that stuff kind of plays into it uh, when it comes to the cost of borrowing, and people are going to be willing to use more of that borrowed money. So you have that, but then you also have the increase in demand part because when people have more money in their pocket, they're spending more money. All this plays in and causes the inflation. When we start talking about gas prices, so, okay, let me go back. The consumer price index does not consider gas and food prices. Because when, and I looked up why, and it says because gas and food are too volatile. They move up and down too much. So when you see that 7.9%, I believe it was, that is the inflation rate uh, year over year that we're dealing with right now. That's not taking into consideration the actual two expenses that are rising more than anything. 
And I have an example. So, I'm using UPS. And I'm just using UPS because it was very easy to find out what their fuel expense was. We know that UPS delivers packages and they use trucks and ships and, or, and uh, planes, right? In 2019, by the way, nearly all cargo ships around the world use diesel fuel. All the semis that we see carrying our food, carrying our um, whatever good it is that is transporting and distributing it to the businesses that we buy them from, use diesel fuel. In 2019, per the uh, Energy Information Association website, this again, government website where I get this, uh, these numbers from, the end of 2019... They had the cost of uh, diesel, the national average cost per di- uh, of diesel is $3.05 a gallon in the United States in 2019. In 2019, UPS's fuel expense was $3.4 billion. Sorry, that was in 2018. In 2018, the diesel expense was uh, $3.30 a gallon. So it was a little bit higher. My bad. So 2018, diesel expense was $3.30 a gallon. And uh, UPS's fuel expense was $3.4 billion. Currently, in 2022, as it stands, the average cost of diesel fuel is uh, $5.10 a gallon. So it's almost doubled when you think about it. It's like 60% increase, 70% increase. So if you divide the $3.30 a gallon by the $3.4 billion uh, of expense that UPS had in 2018, that gives you about 1.03 billion gallons of diesel fuel that they consumed for that year. Let's say demand was the same for UPS and they consumed the same amount of fuel. That, that expense would rise to $5.26 billion from $3.4 billion. So you can see why they would need to increase the cost of shipping to maintain profit margins. In 2018, UPS's net income was $4.79 billion, which means that, that just the increase in fuel prices alone in 2022 would would have not cut that um, margin by roughly 50%. So for UPS to maintain their same mar- their same margins, they have to increase the cost of their services. Because not only is diesel fuel now increasing, but wages have to increase because you're going to have employees that can't work um and can't live off of the salary that they were being paid. In 2018, because it takes money to get to work by the cost of gas, food increases. Why does food increase? Because the cost of shipping increases. So imagine, like I said, all cargo, nearly all cargo ships around the world use diesel. And if the American average went from $3.3, uh, $3.3 a gallon to $5.1 a gallon, then it costs more, a, a lot more money to ship products to the U.S. from the U.S. It costs a lot uh, more to ship products around the U.S. And a lot of these products are food. Food. It also, tractors use diesel to grow the food. That means that farmers, with their tr- with the cost of diesel fuel for farming, has about a 60 or 70% increase. Farmers are already running tight margins for the most part, which means they have to then increase how much they're selling stuff for. All of this, cost of production, cost of distribution, right, wages, all of that stuff plays into inflation. That is why when you hear our government talk about we need to tax these businesses. You know, we need to raise in, uh, you know, income taxes on our businesses, and they act like there's no adverse effect to doing that. No, 
there is an adverse effect, and it's going to fall back on the employees or the consumer. If you increase taxes on a business, then they're paying more, right? But they're bringing in the same amount, which means they have to bring in more to pay more in taxes because they increase the percentage that's being paid. It's a big chain reaction. And when it hits the gas market or the you know the oil industry, it magnifies that reaction because we use oil for everything. So, Lingan, how do they stop the cycle? Well, right now with oil, there's so many different factors that are causing fuel prices to increase, right? When fuel prices increase, everything else is going to increase. But as far as combating inflation overall, how they do it is they raise interest rates. That's the first thing they do. That's usually how they get it under control. Uh, Here in the United States, uh, I believe Australia would be the same way because you have a central bank as well. And, yeah, not to mention OPEC either. And I'm not getting into the whole thing. I'm just, you know, bringing a concept to life for people so they can understand this. Um, When they raise interest rates, they make the cost of borrowing more expensive. It also then, uh, you know, less people tend to buy houses or cars, right? Or if they do, it... They have to pay a little more in interest and not principal. So there's different things. So what's that mean? If you increase the cost of borrowing, um, then it's somewhat taking money out of supply. It also means that uh, your savings accounts rates, the rates for treasury bonds and uh, government securities, the saving, you know, go up, which means people are putting money into that. And they're pulling money out of the stock market. So... When the money comes out of the stock market, equity markets, or they and they're going into the government securities, then it's basically it's taking money out of supply. Even though you still have that money because you saved it, right? It's yours. You're earning interest on that money. It's still taking it out of um, circulation. And as the economy stands, that helps combat inflation. So. I want people to think about this. If you have money in a savings account, that money's not being spent. It's just sitting there. It's it's not it's basically useless unless it's to you, right? You're earning some interest, but it's not being spent, which means that it's not circulate it's you know, it's not a part of that cycle. Uh and I'll I'll hit on that here in a second, Ralph. But the same thing when you put it into an investment like the stock market. That money can actually still be in circulation because those companies can actually offer shares. They can basically take the money that they're, that investors are putting into their stock and utilize it for different things. Um, so Fungi said, yeah, the bank invested. He's right. But a lot of times the bank is uh, investing, again, taking that money, and they may be buying uh, treasuries and stuff because that's how the bank's able to offer a lot of those interest rates too. Or, that you know, in bonds or debt securities and stuff, safer uh more passive investments. So, no, your IRA is not a waste. Absolutely not. I'm just telling you, and look, when they raise, when the uh, Fed raises interest rates, it, this is all short term for the most part, the effect that it would have on the the uh, equity markets. The reason why it has an effect on the equity markets is because a lot of these big investors, banks, hedge funds, all the, the mutual funds, all that stuff, when they're going to make equity investments into the marketplace, they always usually or they usually will weigh the expected return in certain investments uh, to what's called the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is pretty much uh, whatever government, you know, whatever treasury security, like you have your treasury bills, which are your real short-term securities. You you have your treasury notes, which are medi- medium term term, sorry, uh, securities, and then you have your treasury bonds, which are your longer terms. So let's say the you were going to make a, um, I don't know, a five-year investment in the equity market, and you're going to compare it to the risk-free rate. You would compare it to whatever the current rate of a treasury security for the same length of time is. It would be a treasury note for a five-year treasury note. You say, well, what can I get in interest on that? Because it's basically risk-free. You know, it's backed by the faith and credit of the United States. 
uh, as opposed to what the risk is putting it into, let's say, Apple stock. And you have to weigh the the um, difference there. If you're getting next to 0% on a treasury security, then you're going to be willing to invest it in uh, the stock market where, yeah, you have a chance to lose money, but you also have a chance to make a lot of money too. That's why when interest rates are extremely low, you're not making a lot of money in the treasury, so you're just going to go assume the risk in the equity markets and more people are pumping money into the equity markets, which then helps increase you know, those investments. When you can make more on the risk-free side and treasury securities and debt securities, then people will take money out of the equity markets and put it into the, the more safer investments because my brain is exploding. I hope I'm not going – I hope I'm making this clear for people too. And let me know if I'm not. Um, Wolverine says, I just robbed banks like they robbed me. So that's kind of how they combat inflation though. Speak slowly. Okay. Um, as far as how it plays on, you know, personal finances though. With inflation, going back to the inflation stuff. These prices increase when gas increases, when food increases. You may be seeing the 7.9% CPI, and you're, people are like, oh, inflation's at 7.9%, when in reality, it's much higher. Everyone's different, right? I spend, my largest expense, because I drive a lot, is fuel. You know, before uh, the COVID pandemic like back in 2019 I was spending like $200 a week on gas just because of how much I was driving whereas the average person may have only been spending $50 a week one tank where I was filling up two or three times um therefore my personal inflation rate is much higher than 7.9 percent now someone asked so why aren't wages going up wages are that's kind of based on the business, right? It That is business to business. No matter what, we have a minimum wage. It depends on what state you're in. Depend, you know, is what dictates the uh, wages. But a lot of, what's up, Sly? A lot of businesses did increase wages. Some may not have. The reason why you can't leave wages up to a federal mandate, like where the government can just say, oh, you have to increase wages to $15, you know, per hour is because not all businesses can afford that. Like Wolverine here says he got a $3 an hour increase. That's good, but he may work for a company that had, you know, the money to do that. Maybe they're making more money now. And so it was feasible, but not everyone, not everyone's business can do that. He's at a billion dollar company. Well, there you go. Um, some of these smaller mom and pop shops shops can't just go and increase wages to fifteen dollars an hour. Uh, he said, but it doesn't match inflation. It won't always match inflation, and inflation is also different everywhere. You know, like Jesser says, he couldn't do that, and they own a restaurant, right? It's so different company to company, especially if you're starting out. Let's say you're a new business. And you finally got to the point where you could employ someone, you know, one or two people. Well, you still, as the owner, may be struggling trying to get that business up and going and putting all that money back into it. You're paying two employees. You know, you're paying them, let's say, still already above minimum wage. So you're paying them $10, $15 an hour. I don't know. Even though the price of everything's going up and you may be making more money, it's still costing you a lot more money to operate that business, not even counting how much more you may have to increase wages for people. So you may not have the ability to do so. Um, he said, is there government help to business for inflation? I don't think so, <laughs> Ralph. Some of this stuff I got to be careful talking about too as far as, you know, giving people advice on where to go to get help because if my industry sees this, they're going to say I'm making recommendations. Anything I talk about is not a recommendation. I'm just explaining to you how some of this works. Um, 
I'm not sure about government help for inflation. I don't think so. The, the government help you would get for inflation is the Fed increasing interest rates at some point, which they're starting to do. So I just wanted to go into this to explain to people that it's not just that 7.9% that's being reported that inflation is. PPE, PPE is gone. PPE, I believe you meant PPP, like the um, the stuff they were doing for the COVID relief. Yeah, no, I don't think you can get that anymore. You might, and you could go check, but I don't know if that's still available. That wasn't to help with inflation, though. That was to help with uh, lost revenue due to the lockdowns and COVID. You know, the reason I also brought this up is because I saw a tweet from Kamala Harris today. And the tweet said, let me find it. I believe this is it. Nope. Oh, here it is. The tweet says, no one making less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in taxes under our budget. It's time the wealthy and corporations finally paid their fair share. I, it's really inconceivable that we have people that are so ignorant financially running our government. You're paying a lot more in taxes. Here's the thing. Tax rates didn't change. The price of everything you're buying has risen. The, let's say you're in a business where you didn't get a wage increase, so you're making the same amount of money, you're paying more for everything, and the government still taxes you based off your income, so they're taking the same amount from you. Which means that you are left with less of your income now. So if you did get a wage increase, you are going to pay more in taxes, and you're still uh, paying more for all the goods and services. Let's say, like someone said, they got a $3 an hour wage increase. That means you're going to pay more in taxes because you're making more. But everything is also costing you more. But the federal income taxes, as far as, especially if you're a W-2 employee, you're not able to just itemize that stuff all the time. You can try, but unless it, it's more than that, you know, tw- 12500 ish range or $25,000 a year if you're married that for the standard deduction, unless you're itemizing more expenses than that on your federal income taxes, you're not, um, you know, you're not just deducting those expenses. So you're left with more. So they're already wrong on that. You know, as far as the other tax you're going to pay more on is sales tax. You pay substantially more in sales taxes if you're paying more for goods. In Tennessee, we have a 10% sales tax. Which means if I bought something for $10, I'm going to pay $11 total at the store because of that $1 sales tax. Let's say that good increased to $15. Now I'm going to pay $1.50 in sales taxes. You know, so... I'm actually paying 50 pennies more than what um, Kamala Harris said I would. (laughs) Based off of that right there, it's a simple thing. Uh, You know, Ralph Williams asked uh, a couple questions here. He said, I wonder if we're adapting to the Sweden tax model. I don't know what the Sweden tax model is, so I can't go into that. Uh, He also asked, he said, what about those getting Social Security? So Social Security, I believe, adjust. I don't know if it actually adjusts for inflation, but it's usually similar to it. Uh, so they do adjust those benefits. But for anyone to say that, you know, we're you're not going to pay a penny more in taxes based off of our Build Back Better deal or whatever plan they pass, you know, they're only going to increase it on the rich. Well, I just said if you increase expenses on the businesses, you increase expenses on everybody. Um... I think Raccoon's talking about the Social Security. Um, you know, and 
if you even if you leave taxes the same because they're not lowering tax rates on anyone. If you leave taxes the same, but inflation's running wild, you're paying a lot more in taxes. It's it's not benefiting anybody. So I just you know, people need to realize that it just when you there's always a chain reaction to this, especially when it comes to economics. It's not just a we're focusing, you know, taking money on this person and it's not going to have a fallout to anything else. No, it it does not work like that. Um, And, you know, like Lena said, you know, it's sad that I have to explain this. I I wouldn't say it's sad you have to explain it because a lot of people aren't taught this stuff. A lot of people don't know. They just, you know, they're, again, trying to just make ends meet for the most part. But everyone's paying more in taxes. Everyone is. Because there's not one person that hasn't paid more for a good this year than they did last year or the year before or the year before that. So they need to do away with income tax and have a higher sales tax like Tennessee. Now, the federal income taxes and the state income taxes, first of all, I'd never live in a state that has a state income tax. It's crazy. California, um, New York, all of them, they have crazy state income taxes. Florida has no state income tax, which is I'm from Florida and I live in Tennessee. We don't have one here either. And actually, let me talk about that for a second. Now, one thing you always hear is how Trump's tax cuts were just a tax cut for the rich. Did you actually know that it didn't benefit the rich? The only wealthy people that would have benefited under Trump's tax cuts would have been uh, wealthy people in states that didn't have a state income tax, which are a minority. The majority of them do. The highest states, or the highest state income taxes, or SALT tax, state and local taxes, SALT tax, we'll say, the top 10 states for the highest SALT taxes are all Democrat states. That's California, New York, Washington, D.C. is in there, even though it's not a state. Uh, all of them are blue states, though. Trump lowered the maximum amount that you're allowed to itemize on your state and local taxes and deduct from your federal taxes to $10,000. Before, you could you could itemize far more. Now, I can't remember the, off the top of my head what the exact number was, but anyone making under $500,000 generally uh, were not itemizing deductions on their taxes. They were just taking the standard deduction, which means that you know, if you're married, it was around $25,000. You deduct that $25,000 from your income. Whatever's left is what you're paying in federal income taxes. You you can deduct your what you pay in a state income tax from your federal taxes, but under Trump's plan, you can only deduct the $10,000, which means that you were better off to just take the standard deduction than you were to just itemize the $10,000 max. So the people that were the wealthy people, especially in these blue states, were able to deduct far less in their uh, state and local taxes. And most of them were just taking itemized deductions up until about that five hundred thousand dollars a year income level. Now, above that five hundred thousand dollars a year income level. They had to find those, you know, more people were itemizing, but again, they were only allowed to itemize $10,000, which means they were actually paying far more in these states in taxes than they were under um, Obama's tax, tax plan. Far more. In the Build Back Better plan, they are going, the Democrats proposed increasing the $10,000 salt tax deduction to $80,000. Now, the only people that benefit from that increase, which, by the way, it's like, what is that, an 800% increase? Um, the only people that benefit from an $80,000 deduction in state and local taxes are extremely high-earning and wealthy people. Because the regular middle-class and lower-class individual in California or, ten, or New York or something like that, 
are not paying anywhere near the $10,000, let alone $80,000. The Build Back Better plan actually will be a substantial tax break for the wealthy in these blue states. So much so that I read an article that um, said the driving factor for increasing the salt tax in those states was because some Democrats, like in California, were worried that so many of these high earners and these business owners were moving away from California to go to Texas, Tennessee, Florida, that it was going to substantially impact the state's revenue. So they needed a way to incentivize people to stay in these states. It's funny how that works, right? So don't think for a second that when they talk about increasing taxes on the wealthy and the rich, um, that they mean it. Now someone asked, he said, what will that do for, uh, I, I believe he said tax-free states. It won't do a damn thing for tax-free states. So it actually would hurt some of those red states. That's where they'll make up, you know, taxing the wealthy more is in the states that don't have a state tax, state and local tax. Now, everyone has property taxes, but the state income taxes, not everyone does. So that's where they would be making, you know, taxing the wealthy more. But in the in the blue states, and I say blue states because that's just what they are at the moment, um, you know, that's where they're going to have substantial tax breaks. Someone asked, will it turn red to blue? No, it won't. Just because a state is a red or a blue state doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to change tax legislation. It's just, Like I said, it just so happens to be that the states that have the highest state income taxes are all blue states. But there are red states that have a state and local tax. So, it, you know, as far as the political makeup, you know, maybe that plays a role in how much they're taxing state income tax. But it doesn't necessarily play a role in whether or not they have it. See you, Linga. Thank you. So a lot of people don't understand that, though, going back to that salt tax, that the Build Back Better plan, especially in these Californias and New Yorks and stuff, it was going to actually be a major tax cut for the rich. And it's funny to me that anyone would believe a politician wants to raise taxes on the wealthy or on businesses when the, you know, these same politicians need the wealthy and they need those businesses to stay in office. Who are the biggest donors? Go look at Joe Biden's campaign finance. Go look at uh, the Pelosi's campaign finance. Go look at Mitch McConnell's campaign finance. Go look at anyone's. A lot of them that are bringing in a lot of money bring it in from these corporations and extremely wealthy people and these PACs and all that. They need that big money. Why do you think these businesses lobby to them? Do you really think that, and I said this the other day, a rich people, a rich person, not rich, but wealthy person, saying, yeah, I need to be taxed more is the biggest joke to me. If you need to be taxed more and you think you need to be taxed more, then why don't you just stop taking your fucking deductions and just pay the full amount that you would pay on that income or take less of a deduction? You don't need to raise income tax rates to make them pay more money. If you eliminate the deductions, they would pay a lot more money. So, you know, I will say this, Michael, you know, when, when people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates are. Are, are saying that they that, that, that their taxes need to be raised so they're not paying less taxes than their secretaries or or some Tom Dick and Harry you know work on their payroll. I guess the moral of this story you could say is they're they're full of shit. They are. They're they're saying all that to sound good because look, if I wanted to pay more taxes, I wouldn't deduct my standard deduction. I wouldn't deduct the, you know, okay, I'm a ten ninety nine. If I, if I thought I needed to pay more taxes, then I would just not write off my business expenses. Right? I would just pay it on the income, on my total revenue. 
Is that smart business wise? Absolutely not. But that, but if you really think, why does it take you increasing the tax? Why does it take the government fucking telling you that we're going to tax you more and forcing you to pay more? You know, if you actually believe you need to pay more when you can control paying more, just don't deduct. Don't fuck everybody else and make everyone else pay more because you think you need to pay more, but you need the government to force it on you. Just go pay more. The other thing is, no one will voluntarily pay more in taxes. If they would, then why don't they just go stroke a check to the IRS? Hey, here's a donation. Spend it how you feel fit. They don't. In fact, uh, the majority, if not all, of these wealthy people talking about how they need to um, pay more in taxes are donating substantial portions of their income to nonprofits. A lot of the nonprofits are their own nonprofit organization, like the Pelosi Foundation or Clinton Foundation or something like that. And they're deducting it on their income. And then they're doing illegal shit with the nonprofit. So don't, you know, don't don't listen to these, you know, morally correct wealthy people because they're not. And I, I look, I don't want to pay taxes. I, I completely understand businesses that don't want to pay taxes, but don't get up there and act like you you need to be taxed more. It's a bit it's the biggest joke. It's the biggest scam. They're just trying to get customers happy with them. They're trying to get other things happy with them. And and a lot of people don't understand this. You know, if if uh Warren Buffett or Bill Gates makes the comment like I, I should be paying higher taxes than my secretary, well, that's your fault. That's literally a direct um, physical change that you could make right now. Go sit down with your accountants and make sure you're paying more. You're, you're, you're the one that's... Go sell some of your shares in the market. Realize those gains and pay the capital gains on them. It's easy. It doesn't take a lot. It's very simple. Literally click, click of a button going and selling your shares. So I don't want to hear that shit. But as far as, you know, our vice president saying, we're not going to pay a dime more in taxes, you're a damn liar. We're already paying more. Everyone is. And, you know, he said Trump didn't get paid as president. No, he didn't take a salary as president. There's only been two presidents in history. I believe him and it was McKinley was the other one that didn't pay any income tax. Or he didn't uh, take an income as president. You didn't see anyone else do that though, right? So Biden also tweeted today. And he said, a firefighter and a teacher shouldn't pay a higher tax rate than a billionaire pays. That's not right. He said, my budget contains a billionaire minimum income tax to make sure billionaires pay their fair share. Paying a fair share would be paying the same percentage everyone, regardless of your income. If you're making, see, look, a billionaire doesn't necessarily mean that their income is a billion dollars a year. It just means their wealth is a billion dollars. There's big reasons why you don't tax uh, wealth. Because it's not new money. A lot of that money's already been taxed. Or it's held in an investment that is fluctuating daily or monthly or annually and you can't just tax that because the gains on it aren't real. They hold that asset. You know, uh, a tax on an unrealized gain is stupid because you're literally, look, the term unrealized is literally what it means. It's unreal. It's only real once you sell it and you have that cash on hand. The IRS doesn't take unreal money in the you know when they tax unrealized gains they take real cash when they tax unrealized gains which means that you have to have the cash on hand to pay those taxes that's being levied on you on an asset that your cash for that asset is locked up in the asset you don't have that cash available so the only way to go and probably pay substantial amounts of taxes on your unrealized gains would be to liquidate the assets that those gains are in which means that you're going to see a mass sell-off in the markets. 
Um, he said, so your stocks you hold already loses money. I don't know what you mean there, Ralph. If you could clarify. Raccoon says, Musk is paying more income tax than anybody in history. And that's true, too. He's paying billions of dollars. Um, the unrealized gains tax is beyond me why they would ever propose that. So he said, your unrealized gains, so your stocks you hold already lose money. I'm still not curi- uh, understanding fully what you're saying. Regarding the tax, it kind of do isn't that stocks? Yeah, so it well it's stocks. Yeah, okay. Your unrealized gains can be if you own a stock and you have gains on it. It could be if you own a house and the house appreciates in value. Uh, it could be any asset that you buy that is increasing in value or decreasing because you have unrealized losses as well and realized losses. It goes both ways. But anything that is an asset that fluctuates in value there, uh, that's, that is where you start having unrealized gains or losses on. So, you know, to say a firefighter and a teacher shouldn't pay a higher tax rate than a billionaire pays, a billionaire is more than likely earning a lot more annually than a firefighter or a teacher, but... That doesn't mean they're not paying a higher tax rate or a higher amount. If everyone paid a 10% tax on their income, that's called paying your fair share. Everyone's paying the same proportionate amount of their income in taxes. A flat tax rate would be the fairest tax system there is. But people don't look at it like that. People look at it like, well, this person's making more money than me. He's paying the same tax percentage. Therefore, he has more left over than I am. And I call that hating. You're hating on someone if, if, if that's what it is. I've, all, you know, I've always thought that income is a measure of value for the most part. Which means that the people who are making more money are usually bringing more value. That's why um, the NBA makes more money than the WNBA because those players bring in a lot more revenue and a lot more value to the NBA than the WNBA brings. So, you know, don't get mad at someone because their job pays more or their business that they created and worked their ass off to run and operate makes more money than you. You know, in the United States, you can go start a business. You can go pursue something that is going to give you the opportunity to be wealthy and make money. No one is stopping you. You may have certain factors in your life that that make it difficult, but that's all part of the game. You know, they're... Um, you know, the, you can't just hate on someone for being in a better position than you, though, and think that it's only fair if they pay more because you have to pay so much, and they're making more money than you, than you, and they need to pay a higher tax percentage. By the way, did you know that the top 1%, I think, paid like 25% of the income taxes for at the federal level? The wealthy pay more in federal income taxes than the middle and lower class. The majority of people don't even pay federal income taxes. It's the biggest misconception there is. Now, when you start talking about all these businesses need to pay their fair share and stuff, you're getting into a more complicated uh, issue there. Are there some businesses that don't pay taxes? Absolutely. There are others that pay a substantial amount of taxes. So there's a lot that does go on. There are some shady things that go on. I'm not going to deny that. But when you're just talking about the wealthy... And you start bringing in individuals like a firefighter and a teacher talking about how much they pay as opposed to a, another individual. It's not even in the same boat. Yeah, so w- when I was saying the shady stuff and not paying, I'm talking about the businesses, Ralph, not the individuals. The individuals, like a doctor, let's say. Maybe they have their own practice, but a doctor's probably, let's say he's bringing in, I don't know, 800000 to a $1 million a year in income. He's paying 
more than their uh, fair share compared to the lower middle class in federal income taxes. Far more than a fair share. That We have a progressive tax rate, which means that the more money you make, the higher percentage of your income you got to pay. So the wealthy and high earners pay a much larger portion of their income than the lower middle class do. He said, and a doctor is going to have to pay so much student loan debt? Yeah. And uh, he really can't acquire a lot of wealth until he pays that off. That's at, Now, that's not true because I've seen a lot of doctors that have substantial amounts of student loans, and they're making the payments, but they're still making a lot of money. You know, they're, they're still bringing in a lot of wealth. There's doctors that live in Port Royal and Naples, Florida, which, by the way, Port Royal is like a 10 to $15 million neighborhood. Plus, some uh, the most expensive home listing was used to be in Naples. It was like $60 million right on the beach on Gordon Drive. So there are doctors that live in that neighborhood that still have student loans. Now, you want to talk about the student loan thing? If you canceled student loans, you know, and they say, uh, okay, let's cancel student loans. That would free up income for people. It would free up, you know, because they're not making those student loan payments. That actually only benefits the wealthier uh, earners because the mass majority of people that are making payments on their student loans are people who are making enough money to make payments on the student loans because a lot of the student loans are paid back by uh, income-driven plans. And, uh, you know, if you're making not a lot of income, you may not even, even be making a student loan payment. There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of business owners that don't show a lot of income and they don't make student loan payments. So usually the people that are showing a lot more income are the ones that are paying more in student loans. So it's actually disproportionately benefiting the wealthier portion of people who have student loans more than it is the low-income people that have these student loans. Because the majority of the low-income people aren't even paying those student loans. The other thing when it comes to canceling the student loans, is it, that's a joke to me, is it's like, let's cancel this debt to give people the ability to go take out another debt, be it buy a car, you know, because they say, oh, it'll boost the economy because spending in the economy will, will uh, increase because people have more money coming in because they don't have to pay those student loans. So you want them to go... Um, you know, cancel one debt to take out another. And that's a big, the biggest joke to me. Now, if someone says, let's cancel the deficit, all the deficit is, Ralph, is the difference between uh, tax revenue for the government and spending, uh, annual spending for the government. That's all that is. So when you see the deficit is $3 billion, that means we spent $3 billion more than we brought in uh, in tax revenue to pay for those expenditures. So when you say, you know, a president is running, or they say president, but let's just say the government in 2021 is, um, that's debt. I'll go into that in a second. The deficit and debt are different. The deficit is looking at annual spending and the difference. Debt is the overall amount of money that the government owes for past spending, right? If you run a deficit, that's ultimately going to increase the debt. Because you spent more than what you brought in. Uh, not always, because there's some factors that, that play into that. But just trying to keep this simple, right? Um, but when you, see, when you hear, okay, we ran a high deficit in 2021, that means we spent much more than we brought in to pay for those expenditures. Ideally, you would only spend equal to the amount that you bring in. So if the government brings in $3 trillion in taxes, then maybe they should only spend $3 trillion, right? Problem is that doesn't work like that. They'll spend $6 trillion and bring in $3 trillion. Um, the debt, though, that $30 trillion you were talking about, that's all the previous government obligations in, in, you know, that they owe. A lot of the debt, by the way, is owned by the American people. China, I think, owns like 11% of the debt. Japan, I think, actually owns more than China, around 11 or 12%. And some countries owe 
you know, oh, or bu- they own some of our debt, but for the most part, 60 to 70 percent of that debt is owned by the American people and by ourselves. So that's a big misconception because if you go and you buy treasury securities, that's government debt. Uh, you know, so a, a treasury bill, a treasury note, treasury bond, that's all government debt. So a lot of investments, um, you know, if you have a savings account or a money market account, those accounts are, are taking that money and investing it in those securities. That's how they're getting those uh, fixed, inter- you know, very fixed interest rates or ones that don't fluctuate as much. You know, if the bank's offering you a 2% interest rate on your savings account, that's because they're going to be able to take that money and earn more than that 2% in a very safe investment that doesn't fluctuate too much. So that's uh, where a lot of that can come from. And for the most part, when it comes to our government debt, the reason why it keeps rising is, I believe, is because we're really only paying interest on the majority of it. We're not paying back the principal. And our government also takes into consideration what our GDP growth is. And, and again, this is getting complicated uh, for a lot of people. But, you know, they factor in, okay, we can raise the debt ceiling. We can actually, you know... Let me go back. The Build Back Better deal. A lot of the reason why they may pitch it as it being paid for and saying it's not going to increase debt, it's not going to increase the deficit, which is a lie, by the way, but a lot of the reason why they say it's paid for is because they're they're saying that the revenues brought into the bill will offset the actual spending in the bill, but also it will uh, provide economic growth over a, over a period of time that will, you know, basically outgrow the amount of debt that the bill may bring on to the American economy. I'm trying to think of a smoother way to explain that, but they factor in the growth of our economy as a whole, not just the revenues that are brought in from the bill, as a way to pay for the the spending in the Build Back Better deal or the infrastructure deal. Now, the Build Back Better one's funny because that, that it's not paid for. In fact, it's going to be very costly. Um, Ralph Williams says, evil, but you know they swore the way they expect everyday Americans to keep up with their pay if we as a country don't do it. Evil, but you know they swore the way they expect every Amer- everyday Americans to keep up with their pay if we as a country don't do it. I don't understand that. Um, <laughs> that's all right. But, you know, what? I bring this up because, again, it's a chain reaction, right? Everything kind of plays in uh, to the economy as a whole and to prices as a whole, especially gas prices. Gas prices increase so many other things because that expenditure it's such a high expenditure for a lot of businesses. And, you know, how do we get most of our uh, food to stores? Through semi-truck. Think, what was it? Any product that we buy was on a truck at some point. That's why having a trucker protest that, you know, sh- let's say 90% of the truckers went to D.C. and protested, the economy immediately, immediately would shut down. It would crush the American economy if that happened. Why do you think Canada was freaking out about it? But, um, so he says, it's funny how they expect everyday Americans to pay our credit card debts, but we as a country do the same thing and don't pay it. You're right. I always think it's funny when they say we're going to raise the debt ceiling. Raising the debt ceiling is basically like we're going to take out more debt to pay off our previous debts. That's the better. That's the best way to think about it. Let's take out one loan to pay for another. And it's a never-ending cycle. Um, Or as Rand Paul would say, Michael, um, we we just got to continue to borrow more money from China and other countries who hate our guts. Yeah, well, you know, there's still more to that story, though, when it comes to to that. Because we're buying Chinese debt, too. Don't let anyone fool you. 
people act like we don't buy their debt. We do. Go look, and I guarantee you that you can find out how much of the Chinese debt is owned by the United States or other countries. We, it's, it, everyone does it, okay? Uh, he says, mm-hmm. getting coal to power plants by a train truck. Exactly. A, a good point, Raccoon, right? And that's So you're increasing the power of energy there. Uh, he says, as we pay off, as we paying the debt off with all these masks, or the debt off with all these masks that we buy from China. Yep. You know, when it comes to uh, this is getting into a whole different conversation, but since we're on the topic of economics, why would the United States not manufacture certain products? Right. So there's, I got it. I'm gonna. I, you know what? Before I even go really deep into this, I'm gonna have to go do some reading up to to refresh on this. But basically, you have some countries have competitive advantages, just like we have a competitive advantage in certain things, and we base it off of that a lot of times, right? Uh, we'll specialize in certain industries, and another country may specialize in certain industries that they have a competitive advantage in. You know, and that kind of plays into it. So I'm going to have to do a whole episode on that, explaining that, and go back and refresh because um, that's getting into a whole different topic. But um, exactly, Raccoon, and I've said that before. When it comes to the global economy, not all country plays by the same rules. It'd be one thing if we had global trade, but every country had to abide by the same labor laws and every country had to abide by the same wage requirements, you know, all of that stuff, right? But it's not. It's not the same playing field. Which means that countries like China, who can go and exploit slave labor, can lower the cost of production substantially. That also means that companies may have a huge incentive to go to these countries that allow this where they lower their cost of production. That's also why you have outsourcing. And then that means that here in the United States where we do take care of our workers for the most part and we do have these restrictions and and regulations on our businesses, it does take some of the competitiveness away. And I'm just being realistic about this. Um... That I'm not saying I, you know, in promoting, excuse me, slave labor, not at all. I'm just telling you how it is around the world. So, um, you know, those are just things to think about. They're not playing fair. These countries aren't. And that is why probably that the United States is losing a lot of this control over the world economy. But... You know, don't let anyone fool you. We are still by far the largest economy in the world, and we have the most power economically in the world. People can say what they want about China, but if we sanctioned China's ass, it would fucking shut them down in a heartbeat, and we would still be able to survive. Now, I don't know about Europe, you know, but we could survive without China. China's not going to be able to survive it without us. I can tell you that right now. No matter what people think, that's the truth of the matter. All right. China has been a shithole country for the last 200 years, except for recently. And it still is a shithole country and a communist country, but they've grown. But they weren't just this powerhouse economy until recently. The United States has been the largest economy since the late 1800s. You know, we've we've been at the top. And we can remain at the top, and we don't need anybody else. We just choose to freaking rely on everyone else. Um, so, you know, people need to understand that. Now, moving on to the next topic I had today was uh, an update on the Ukraine war here. And I don't know if you guys saw yesterday, but Ukraine took helicopters into Russia and blew up an oil depot. And I think that this that could be a problem for Ukraine because now Russia's looking at it like, whoa, now we have an attack on our own soil. You kind of changed the game. And I, the other thing I thought about too is 
the Ukrainian helicopters were able to get past um, the air defenses of Russia, or not the air, I said air defense, but like radars and stuff, undetected. And you know Russia has to be thinking, well, if Ukraine can get some helicopters into Russia without being detected to blow up an oil depot, what could the United States get in here? What could they sneak in without us having no idea? That has to be a major concern of Russia right now. Because as far as I know, these weren't like some stealth helicopters or anything that Ukraine had. Um... Which can bring you back to the theory of, was it really Ukraine? Or was this an attack that Russia kind of did to themselves? To maybe have an excuse on why there's less oil leaving the country into Europe. And also to, you know, kind of keep this invasion going and keep a fire under this conflict. Or if Ukraine really did send helicopters into Russia and blow up this oil depot, you know then what would the United States be able to do? I mean, how could we not get in there with stealth fighters and bombers and stuff and, and or anything and pose a threat to Russia? You know they have to be worrying about that. So, you know, as far as what I've seen today, uh, some news out of Kiev that Russian forces have been driven out of the Kiev area. And that the Ukrainian flag was still flying over Kiev. Apparently, I guess, Russia is supposed to be focusing operations more on the eastern, the Donetsk, Luhansk regions of the country. I think that this isn't, this is long from over. And I don't know if they'll pressure Kiev as much, but they're going to keep, keep going in these other large cities. Um, But, I, you know, the overall goal of Russia as this con- as this invasion draws on becomes more and more unclear because they're experiencing what's being reported by them pretty substantial cost in human life and vehicles and to their military as a whole and they don't seem to have a clear objective um to my knowledge and from what I've seen it, it just does not seem like it's a very clear objective BP, I, I think that's you over here on Facebook, too. So, it, I'm uh, going to open the lines up for anyone who wants to call in and ask any questions. You're more than welcome to. I think I covered a lot as far as the economics part is concerned. And I wanted to kind of give that update and see if anyone had seen the recent attacks there in Ukraine. But feel free to call in. I'm trying to think. There was something else I was going to bring it up and I don't remember what it was by the way on Tuesday uh Saul Blue Sister is going to be hosting my show and she's picked a good topic on voting and I'll have it probably up later today uh, as far as what the topic is in the description that she sent me but don't forget to uh, tune in for that because I think it'll be a very good conversation and uh Eric were you going to say something um, I guess we're still waiting. I guess if Raccoon or Marcos or any other friends want to participate. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, um, and I know you probably have about another 30 or 35 more minutes left before Podbean kicks you out or gives you that two-minute warning. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close out the Facebook feed, though. I appreciate everyone that was watching on Facebook. Hold on, Eric, uh, uh-huh. for watching. Again, don't forget, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's just Real Conservative Talk. Uh, I've been posting these videos on there every time I do them, you know, and I am now wanting to grow the YouTube channel. Um, so, yeah, you know, go subscribe. This is Real Conservative Talk. And then on Facebook, I don't know if I'll do a show tomorrow, but we will be back on Monday. We'll be on WESN, by the way. We have Ralph Williams in here. Go check out WESN, too. He has a lineup of a bunch of different shows. Um, I'll probably be on WESN more. I just, before I got on here, saw Ralph's uh, message to me as far as a new schedule. I believe it's going to be four days out of the week instead of just two. But, yeah, that's a you know good platform as well. You can download the app on your phone. Also, everyone listening on Podbean that has a podcast, if you're not paying for the Podbean subscription and you want to try it out, 
uh, go on. You can use my code. It's R C T K E K E E. So just R C T K E E. Um, and you can use that code. You can actually get the first month free for that. And then if you want to cancel it after that free month, that's up to you. I don't care. But you can use that code. You can get a month free. That gives you the unlimited podcast and any other benefit that comes from uh, a subscription you pay for hosting your podcast. This goes for anyone else that wants to host a podcast as well on Podbean. Is it case sensitive uh, promo code? No, it's uh just RCT key, and it should be in the little greeting message too. But uh, he said, "Damn, I thought I'd get a month free." Well, you would. Uh, Solid Blue, you would if you went and uh, did the subscription. You get a month free, and then. You know, if you want to cancel it, you got to cancel it. Otherwise, they're going to start drafting money. But you could get the month free, yeah. Again, don't tell them I told you that, even they're going to listen to this. So, just something to know. And I appreciate you guys uh, look 